know, there's two functions of diversity. One is resilience. If I said, I'm going to put one species down on this whole roof, you're putting all your eggs in that one basket. And if that doesn't perform well, then you're going to have some, some substantial issues. My rule of thumb is I like to use about 12 species, keeping in mind that maybe one or two of those probably aren't going to do well, a couple are maybe going to do better. That's from a resilience standpoint. The other part of it is a diversity standpoint. So actually being able to integrate plants that are going to provide different bloom times, different textures, different colors, and uh, you know have some of that aesthetic and sort of seasonal variation of that. Uh, and then as you go from extensive to intensive roofs, you have a lot more flexibility incorporating that. But it comes with the more different plant material and more, say, woody or, or leafy vegetation, you're gonna, <coughs> your water use is going to go up substantially. But seasonality is a big aspect of that. Diversity. So you get these really interesting color and textural variations of the sedums itself. So sedum organum is typically a red species. Uh, these are both uh, natives. The spathifolium is actually a variety of a native plant. And then the best story I had was I planted one of these roofs for a client and six weeks after it was planted, they like called me. They're like, did you know those things bloom? You'll get like a dozen different colors of, of sedum bloom and the they'll happen at different times of the year. So being able to incorporate that and people start like, oh, I can see what's going on and, and being able to connect with that. But the, the sort of textural variation, you know, they have these really fine leaf, getting toward, more towards a, a leafy, less succulent vegetation. And there's an important aspect of uh, a sedum like this, which is uh, Kamchatakum is deciduous. So it's actually a sedum that's going to lose leaves and so I've seen this planted in big masses that people are like great it looks awesome and then it's all gone. The strategy for planting vegetated roofs my rule of thumb is 10 percent organic matter that I like to shoot for. If you can mix 10 percent of your plants these evergreen ones with deciduous sedums and mix those throughout your your plant palette all that leaf litter is actually going to replenish the organic matter in your soil it's going to reduce the need for fertilization. So you're creating this sort of self-governing, low-maintenance, resilient ecosystem. And it's always a balance, because if you, you want to provide the aesthetic, and there's like certain aspects that you want to incorporate maybe different diversity into it, but in this case, it's a functional thing. And it also eliminates the issue of large patches of deciduous sedums that end up with a bunch of bare soil at certain times of year. Ice plant in California is a, a nightmare, and the Pacific Northwest, because it's not invasive here, is a great opportunity for a really hardy succulent vegetation. It's got great blooms. Hens and chicks, again, self dividing, sorting. One of the things with some of these is you have to look at the interplay between species because if you plant sedums and you plant hens and chicks, the sedums are going to like totally dominate. If you're going to manage it and you're going to come in and like maybe do more vegetation management, having that mix works. If you're going to just let everything be a free for all, you're going to get certain species that dominate and certain ones that, you know, just don't can't can't compete. But overall, the whole idea is that you want to create this matrix that provides 100% soil coverage because then that eliminates weed colonization and reduces maintenance significantly. And in a short period of time with cuttings, you can actually get full soil coverage and season two is going to go down dramatically as you get more vegetated cover in that way. And then the other thing is bringing in some accent. One of the things I, I, I talked to somebody early on and it was a guy who was an expert on Columbia River native perennials and he's like, I have all these things that would be great for green roofs. And he's so and so we actually tested it out on a couple of projects. We like brought in native perennials that grow in cliff faces and like that that seem to be good at uh, adapting to the particular characteristics of the site. And a lot of times the the adaptations are happening where roots will gr grow down into cracks in rocks and get vegetation, or you'll get dieback during hot times of the of the year. But we found this, this potential list of 100 species, and there were about you know, a dozen that actually did really well, because on a vegetated roof, you're actually, you know, a, a cliff face in the gorge, there's some like microclimate, a, a green roof, you're creating this like very uniform, thin soil profile with no substrate for them to move into. So things want to like maybe grow down, they hit the root barrier, that's all they're doing, and then they start you know, dropping like flies. So 
So it's experimentation, and it's not intuitive. Like plants, you're like, this is super hardy, it's gonna do great, do terrible. Other ones are like, this is never gonna last. And this is one where Louisii does great in two inches of soil. And it adds some, some texture and color variation as well. And then being able to bring in things like ornamental grasses, native grasses for accent, for texture, coast strawberries, super great one for vegetated cover and doesn't actually die back very significantly and what that is is you know this is a great example of combination of sort of sedum succulents wildflowers perennials and looking at you know there's probably 60 different plants on this 1500 square foot roof and over time the the mix has changed and there's some like patterns in there but not to get too attached to like any sort of structural pattern or whatever that it's going to evolve and it's going to sort of change, but what it's doing is actually like all those plants finding their niches and, and developing into something that's like functionally very, you know, specifically good in that way. I got really fascinated with people giving a lot of pushback about irrigation on green roofs. And I think I don't necessarily like, oh, we got to water everything, but there's like certain functional needs for, for irrigation and why we would use it on certain things. The biggest starting argument of that was, well, Germany doesn't actually irrigate green roofs. And I was like, okay, this is weather patterns in four of the cities that, that have the most sort of history with vegetated roofing. So they have a 12 month cycle of rainfall that's relatively consistent. So, and then you overlay that with Pacific Northwest, lots of rain, no rain. So that was sort of the thing of like, you know, using Germany as an example was sort of comparing apples to oranges because it was something where it, it didn't necessarily apply in that way. And it was sort of eye-opening for, for people, but again, you have to sort of take something that's work somewhere else and adapt it to the, the local climate that you're dealing with. So the other part of it was like, oh, other places in the country are not doing irrigation. And again, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, New York City, 12-month cycle. Actually, New York City is surprisingly gets more rainfall than Portland and Seattle, like more total rainfall. They get it over a 12-month cycle. We don't have that big dip in those times. We could start having a conversation about it after that. And again, it's not about providing ton of irrigation, it's about dealing with this. So the fact that we have these substantial periods during July to mid-September where we have a very significant drought and comparing that to vegetation that needs to be able to thrive and do well in high precipitation times throughout the rest of the year. So that is essentially the west coast of the U.S. dilemma. And I've done, I've done one project in L.A., and that was one where it was just like, you essentially have this huge drought period. So it makes us look, you know, positively moist during the <laughs> August. When we have our lowest precipitation is also when we have our highest temperatures and our highest evapotranspiration. So worst case scenario for plants, least amount of precipitation. Even with sedums, they're probably the best adapted plant for these types of situations. They're not gonna be able to handle 30 to 40 days of a trace of precipitation. So over a month with no appreciable precipitation, which can happen definitely during August, uh, September. And I think uh, the one, when I looked at all the data, there was actually one stretch, uh, I think it was 20 years ago or something, 71 days, a 71 day stretch with no precipitation at uh, not a trace of precipitation at all. So that's a, that's a lot to ask of any plant to be able to handle that. Terrestrial <coughs> vegetation, adapted native vegetation in, in the proper climate is actually adapted to, to handle that and can work on it. We're creating a very unique, thin soil microclimate. So other than plastic vegetation, I think that's the only thing that, that might work. Smaller scale projects, hand watering is, is always an option, but for a lot of projects, efficient irrigation. One of the things that people are like, okay, let's use drip. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but this is the one I like to use the most. So spray rotors actually are the, the highest efficiency water delivery system that actually works well on a rooftop. And these are different than spray heads because instead of spray heads, which sort of uniformly send out a, a stream, these are actually like small streams of water that are emitted and larger droplets. So they have less influence of wind throw, so they don't get blown around a lot. They also don't sort of evaporate in a high exposure condition. The other thing I've used is capillary drip irrigation. So actually it rests along the bottom 
of the soil profile and water comes out and with the proper soils will actually move upward under the soil profile and will sort of fill up the, the void of that. It's super efficient. It requires very specific soil conditions that have to be tested before you do the project to make sure that you actually get that capillary action. Greener soils, because they're mineral, they don't have a lot of organic matter, they have a lot of pore space, are not really predisposed to to having that capillary action. This is probably the best choice. There's issues with traditional spray, especially when you put it on top of the building. You're very exposed, you get tons of wind drift. You, know, you take something that's by nature about 50% efficient and you make it probably closer to like 20 or 25% efficient. So it's not really the best way to establish vegetation. Drip is based on that same sort of capillary action and sort of lateral movement of water through soil profile. So if you have like sort of a regular soil with a lot of fines, there's the emitter, and you'll get this really great sort of movement laterally and then down through the soil profile, which uniformly provides you know, wetness to the soil. This is sandy soil, but very similar to how a green earth soil, a, a porous green earth soil mix. Water will come out of the emitter and just go right through the soil profile and out. So you won't get movement laterally. So one option would be to put emitters like every three inches, which maybe isn't super cost effective, but it, it's a learning experience because we did a, a project early on that uh, was seeded and literally at each emitter location was where you had a nice little green patch and then everything in between that was brown. And I was just like, oh yeah, I can see that happening. So, so drip is uh, drip's tough on, on roofs, particularly with those soils. And then a critical part of that, again, going back to the efficiency aspect of only watering when we need it and only providing that minimal amount of water. And we're talking about to the degree of a quarter to maybe a third of an inch a week. So it's like very minimal, like garden irrigation is substantially higher than that. So we're just providing this basic supplemental irrigation. So my favorite is ET controller that's connected to ideally on-site weather station. So you've got You've got on-site specific data and then supplemented with moisture sensor. It's actually sensing the, the soil moisture. I mean, the whole system of this, moisture sensor, weather station, and ET controller is a, a couple of thousand dollars. It's not like a ton of investment, but if you compare it to wholesale failure of your roof or having to like have somebody that's there like watching and making sure everything's happening, it's, it's pretty priceless. And the difference between the the ET controller and a traditional controller is the tr traditional controller you sort of set and it's, you know, it turns on, it runs for a certain amount. The ET controller, you set a baseline and then based on the weather and the soil moisture, it'll adjust and say, oh, it rained a few days ago, I just need to provide this much water. And then if it's dry, it'll provide more water. So it's actually like smarter than uh, somebody actually doing it by hand. And like I said, there's a certain scale of project. There's you know, residential scale, small scale, where people just go and hand water. It works great. The one thing I've found is by the time you think about it and you're like, it's been like 90 degrees for like the last week and maybe I should, and by the time you get up there, it's already like too late. It's like things have already like degraded to the sense. So taking that human element and or somebody's on vacation that's supposed to be watering it. It's like having that autom automation is, is pretty helpful.